What's up, Millennial Travel Podcast listeners? It's Matt Wilson coming to you with another episode. And today we are going to continue on our journey throughout the world. We have some amazing content for you at the Under 30 Experiences blog, under30experiences.com slash blog. And we have been, I have been personally creating content that shares everything that I know about destinations for solo travel. So uh, we started in the United States. We went down through Central America, uh, Mexico, and the Caribbean, continued to South America, and now we are over in Europe. And I just noticed I have something on my shirt. So if you're watching on YouTube, um, well, that's my uh, little daughter's food. So uh, here we go. I am going to let you know all the best places and what to do traveling in Europe. Now, these are only the places that I know about. Uh, there are plenty of other places that I did not include the guide that I simply just don't have expertise in. So, uh, but the solo travel destinations and tips that I am going to provide here, quite a lot of countries, the United Kingdom, uh, which we are going to talk about England and then Scotland, Spain, France, Italy, Iceland, Greece, Croatia, Central Europe, uh, being the three cities of Prague, Vienna, and Budapest. And uh, yeah, there are, of course, tons of other places in Europe to explore, but those are the big ones that I'm going to lay out for you here today. So we're going to start uh, this travel guide in London, travel through the English-speaking countries of Scotland and Ireland, uh, then through, oh, I didn't say Ireland before, oops, um, and then through Western Europe, Iceland, and finally to Central Europe. Uh, exploring Europe is an opportunity of a lifetime. You'll love Europe if you enjoy history, architecture, food, and culture. If you have lots of time to backpack through Europe, you can visit all of the countries I recommend, and then some. If you have less time and money, you can visit any of these countries as a solo traveler on individual week-long trips. And uh, like I said, if you're looking to explore a different part of the world, check out my guides to the United States, Central America, uh, South America, and those are all found on under30experiences.com slash blog. This article is also there on the blog where you can get all of the links to the places uh, that I'm talking about because I am going to go through and try to pronounce everything as best as I can. Uh, English, Spanish, I can handle. French, okay, I can probably try to pronounce it, uh, but other than that, it could there could be a couple ugly ones in there, so please, uh, I'll do my very best. And as always, I encourage you to challenge yourself, travel sustainably, and use travel as a vehicle for personal growth. And if you're new to travel, you can check out the ultimate guide to solo travel, and that is, there's a link at the top right on the homepage of under30experiences.com. So without further ado, let's get into it, the United Kingdom. If this is your first time traveling alone and English is the only language you speak, consider a trip to the United Kingdom. The two main tourist destinations that we'll be covering are great are England and Scotland. Wales and Northern Ireland are also part of uh, are also part of the United Kingdom, but we'll leave those two countries for a future article. So London. There are a few cities in the world more famous than London, England. There's so much to see and do in London, but unfortunately, it's one of the most expensive cities in the world. I'd suggest spending your money on good food and drink while seeing as much as you can on foot, using the London Underground and visiting many free outdoor spaces and museums. But first things first, let's get you a selfie with the famous Beefeater Guards at the Tower of London. Built in 1078, see the crown jewel and the world's first tourist attraction, the Line of Kings, established in 1652. Not far from Tower Bridge, Greenwich Park is the London base of the Royal Navy. Be sure to check out the Cuddy Shark, a 19th century clipper ship. 
relax in Greenwich Park and enjoy the Rose Garden, Tea House, and Deer Park. Museums in England are free, so take advantage. Your travel budget won't go to waste if you decide to leave. Uh, check out the British Museum, home to the Elgin Marbles and the Rosetta Stone. The National Gallery has paintings from all over Europe dating back to 1260. There's so much to do in London as a solo traveler. Visit Big Ben, Westminster Abbey, Buckingham Palace, the London Eye, the Globe Theatre, Camden Town, and tons more. I enjoyed uh, Trafalgar Square sometimes in big cities. I just like to sit and people watch, hang out, practice non-judgment, non of course, and um, yeah, just a, a fun thing to do that I'm sure a lot of people do as well. So those are a lot of good places uh, to participate in some good old fashioned people watching. Escape the bustling city of London to the city of Bath, just an hour and a half away, and see the 2000 year old Roman baths fed by hot springs. And if you want to wake up in Europe feeling refreshed, you can read my hardcore traveler's guide to beat jet lag, which I give a link to in the blog article. All right, the British country, countryside. Outside of London, the price of your trip will start to get less expensive. Consider exploring the towns near the coast, like Cornwall, Brighton, Weymouth, Dover, or Newquay. If you are from New England, like I am, you'll recognize a lot of these names and probably feel right at home. If you love adventure travel, you want to get to the Lake District National Park home of 12 of the country's largest lakes. You can conquer England's highest peak, Scaffold Pike, at 3,200 plus feet. Uh, it's a 5.7 mile hike out and back. You can rent or hire a boat, uh, as they say, cycle, stargaze. If you get there in the winter, there's a one day winter skills course that I would love to take. Uh, you get to learn to use crampons, ice axes, other mountaineering tools. Um, if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you can get the link to our beginner's guide to camping. Uh, finally, no UK guide would be complete without Stonehenge. Uh, located in the historic city of Salisbury, uh, or near there, the pre prehistoric monument dates back to somewhere between 3000 and 1500 BC. We know little about how these massive stones got there. And this 2.4 mile hike is the best way to see Stonehenge for free. And I link to that hike in the guide. Scotland. Scotland is an incredible country, especially for those who like the outdoors. The scenery looks straight out of Harry Potter. Uh, Loch Ness Monster is just as mythical. The Scottish are fiercely independent and half of the nation's citizens believe they should be separate from the United Kingdom. Chances are you will love Scotland. From London, instead of flying, consider reducing your carbon footprint and traveling to Edinburgh by train. Traveling by train is a great chance to see the countryside and watch the world go by without the stress of major airports like Heathrow, Edinburgh. Uh, oh, Edinburgh also has an international airport that you can fly into. And uh, Glasgow is another city that is popular with young people. So, Edinburgh. First thing I recommend doing in Edinburgh is having a whiskey. Uh, Scotland has over 130 Scotch distilleries, so if you like to drink, go for a whiskey tasting. Uh, check out Edinburgh's underground vaults at night. This haunted area of the city was once home to speakeasies, gambling pubs, and brothels. Shake off the cobwebs the next morning with a 30 minute hike up Arthur's Seat for a marvelous view of the city below from an extinct volcano. Uh, for an easier climb, walk up Calton Hill, which is also great at sunset. Spend the afternoon in the tranquil Dean Village, uh, Old Town, or have a picnic in the meadows if you're into landmarks. Uh, Edinburgh does not disappoint to walk the Royal Mile from Edinburgh Castle to the Palace of Holyrood, see the Georgian House Museum, the Scottish National Gallery, the Scott Monument, and the National Museum. All right, Fort William. From Edinburgh, motor to Stirling Castle, and then through Glencoe. 
Scenic Valley where Harry Potter was filmed. Uh, hike the Lost Valley, look up our friends at Up and Dune Adventures, uh, stay in a bed and breakfast, uh, make sure, and I, I link to the, our favorite uh, bed and breakfast, be sure to make reservations in advance. Peak season is July and August. All of Europe is on vacation and accommodations across Scotland fill up quickly. Uh, Hike to Steel Falls, one of the most memorable trails in the West Highlands. Uh, have lunch in Glenfinnan and then see the Jacobite steam train crossing the 21 arched viaduct, another Harry Potter highlight. Uh, hopefully you guys know what I'm talking about with that steam train that's going across there. Uh, if you want to relax, uh, you can go to another Scotch distillery, enjoy a walk to the Neptune staircase, or take the UK's only mountain gondola to the Nevis Range for a panoramic view of the Scottish Highlands. Ireland. All right, Ireland is a magical country for solo travelers. I spent three weeks staying with friends who lived in Dublin, and while they were working during the week, I rented a car, borrowed a tent, and explored the countryside. On the weekends, we did day trips from Dublin, saw the inside of plenty of pubs, uh, as you can imagine, in the evening hours, and there's, there's really nothing like Irish pub banter. It's a lot of fun, or as they say, it's good crack. So, Dublin. If you're continuing your Euro trip from London, travel to Wales by train and take the ferry across the Irish Sea to Dublin. I arrived by sea on a foggy day and it really set the tone for the Emerald Isle. Uh, when I get to a new city, I always like to say, take a city tour, get acquainted with the main sites, uh, hear some history and culture from a local, walking around the Trinity College, St. Stephen's Green, Temple Bar, it's a great way to get familiar with Dublin's tourist areas. I've been to Dublin in the summer and then again in November, and if you don't mind the rain and cooler temperatures, I'd highly suggest traveling off-season. You'll see that Grafton Street is packed with tourists during July and August. Uh, for those who enjoy local libations, the Guinness Storehouse and the Jameson Whiskey Distillery are fun places to get acquainted. The Temple Bar area is one of the main nightlife spots for backpackers, tourists, and uh, the old st stag and hen parties. Uh, that's bachelor and bachelorette uh, parties for anybody who doesn't speak uh, Irish. or I, I don't know if they say this in, in the UK, but stag and hen, that's what they call them in, in Ireland. But don't forget, Dublin isn't just a party destination. It is also a UNESCO city of literature. So... You can take the Dublin Literary Pub Crawl, where you'll find out that many of the great works were, you guessed it, fueled by alcohol. Uh, to find some solace outside of pub life, relax in St. St. Stephen's Green, or <clears throat> for a quiet park with more room uh, to walk, head to Phoenix Park. I was pleasantly surprised by the amount of deer in this park within city limits. Actually, more than pleasantly surprised, I was uh, was fairly shocked. I did not expect to see deer there. Um, finally, for day trips from Dublin, see the small coastal town of Hoth and hike out onto the cliffs or head to Brayhead Cliff Walk, both accessible by light rail. Uh, one of my highlights of Ireland was my time in solitude in the Wicklow Mountains, like the 6th century monk St. Kevin. Uh, apparently seven trips to the monastery in Glendalough is, wait, Glendalough, shoot, uh, sh should be Glendalough, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> reading it, it's not pronounced as it's red, I believe, uh, kind of like Edinburgh, uh, which you don't want to say it as it's read. Anyway, uh, moving on, that's like a pilgrimage going to this place, Glendalough. Um, it's like a pilgrimage to Rome for Irish Catholics. So I strongly urge solo travelers to be eco-friendly and safe. So take the bus to the Wicklow Mountains National Park if you can, instead of renting a car and driving on the opposite side of the road that you may be accustomed to. I will tell you, I've done it and uh, I have 
on more than one occasion almost steered into oncoming traffic making a left turn. So the Irish countryside, there's a ton to explore between Dublin and Galway, more than I could possibly cover in this guide, but I'll do my best to pull some headlight <laughs> highlights. Kilkenny is a great Irish town. Uh, rent a bicycle and see Kilkenny Castle, uh, St. Canis Cathedral, and the Round Tower. Experience Ireland's national sport by taking a hurling lesson where you'll get out on the pitch and play the world's fastest sport. That's right, it's hurling. Uh, on your way west, stop at the Rock of Cashel to get your fix of the 12th century Gothic architecture. Cork is a university city in the south of Ireland, uh, full of live music and nightlife. Many people kiss the Blarney Stone, but I'm not sure how popular that's going to be post-COVID. So I would honestly skip the attraction. Um, I've done it. The castle grounds are really nice, uh, so it was fun to uh, fun to walk around. But Whale watching is another popular activity in Cork. And if you can get there for the Jazz Fest, I really enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. Tons of live music outside in the streets in Ireland, everywhere you go. The western coast of Ireland is known as the Wild Atlantic Way. So seeing the sunset over the North Atlantic Ocean from the small town of Dingle was one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. You can drive the Ring of Kerry and the lesser known Skellig Ring. Uh, take a boat out to Skellig Michael, but do not camp on the cliffs as I did. I don't know why you would do it. Um, I can tell you why I did it, but that's uh, for another story. But my tent snapped in half from the strong winds and I ended up spending the nights in one of the monks' beehive huts. So at least I have a good story about it. The farmer told me not to do it. Uh, after Killarney National Park, head north to the Cliffs of Moher. Uh, part of the uh, Buren and Cliffs of Moher. Oh, this is part of the Buren and, uh, Buren and Cliffs of Moher UNESCO Geopark. Arrive early before the coach buses full of tourists. Uh, look and look over the 35 species of birds, including, you guessed it, puffins. Are puffins a bird? Are they a mammal? Not sure. Penguins are mammals. I'm gonna go with bird. I don't know why. Visit O'Brien's Tower where you'll be able to view the Aran Islands and Connemara. All right, Galway. For an authentic Irish experience, explore Galway's live Irish folk music scene with people playing outdoors, like I said, in the cobblestone streets. Stroll the Salt Hill Promenade, pop in the shops and pubs along the Galway Bay, visit Galway's modern cathedral, um, some of Ireland's oldest uh, places, in, including St. Nicholas's Collegiate Church, tour the Kilmacdow Monastery and the Galway City Museum. There's so lots to do in the countryside near Galway, including hiking Diamond Hill in Connemara National Park, visit the Sheep and Wool Center to learn how the traditional textiles are made. All right, Spain. España is a beautiful country to explore as a solo traveler. I suggest brushing up on your Spanish if you can so the locals take you a bit more seriously. Fly into the international airports in Madrid or Barcelona, and from there, take trains to the smaller cities. The food and culture in Spain are incredible, and they vary greatly from region to region. The first uh, thing to know about Spain from a cultural and logistical standpoint is that there is a siesta or a nap in the middle of the day, and dinner won't be served until 9 or 10 p.m., so this means the party scene doesn't start until after midnight, so please pace yourself. All right, Madrid. Your days in Madrid will be full of incredible cityscapes like Plaza Mayor, uh, La Puerta del Sol, and Plaza uh, Cibeles. Palacio Real is the king of Spain's official residence and open to the public. Uh, stop into museums like, shoot, 
sorry, these are all really long Spanish names for these museums, but Museo Nacional Centro de Arte Reina Sofia. That translates to the National Center, Museum Center of, the, of Art uh, Queen Sofia. Not necessarily in that order, but uh, yeah, that's a long ass name for a museum, I'll tell you that. Uh, the Naval Museum and the Archaeological Museum. For a local experience, uh, pick up a bottle of Spanish wine and some tapas uh, from Mercado de San Miguel. Uh, have a picnic in Plaza Mayor and uh, do some shopping, eating, drinking in Barrio Latina. Uh, finally, to earn ultimate bragging rights, try, try to get tickets to see Real Madrid play in a soccer match. All right, Seville. Take the high-speed train from Madrid to Sevilla, as it's called, uh, the capital of Andalusia. The main attraction in Seville is uh, Real Alcazar, uh, the UNESCO heritage site. The royal palace boasts incredible Moorish architecture, still in use today. Get lost in the historic Jewish quarter. See how Christians, Muslims, and Jews have populated this part of Spain for hundreds of years. Visit Plaza España and two incredible churches. Sorry about the names, but Iglesia de San Isidro and the Cathedral of Seville. Uh, climb the Giralda Bell Tower and walk around Parque Maria Lucia. Luisa. Hmm, hope that's not a, spell, a spelling error. We'll see. Luisa or Lucia? I'm not sure. For more hands-on activity, you can take the Spanish tile workshop or a flamenco dance class. Enjoy some tinto de verano, which is uh, red wine. Um, so, uh, Seville's version of sangria, not red wine. What do I know? <laughs> Just get stick to this trip, dude. Uh, for nightlife, be sure to uh, hit the Al Almeida de Hercules neighborhood or Almeida as the locals call it. Escape uh, Seville to the coast for a beach day in Cavies. See the castle of San Sebastian and the castle of Santa Catalina. Granada. All right, from Seville, travel to train by Gr to Granada, another city heavily influenced by the Moors. You can stroll around the grounds of the Palace of uh, Alhambra, and if you want to go inside, be sure to book your tickets in advance. Uh, at the base of Alhambra, you can visit Banuelo, and that is a famous Arabic bathhouse. In the center of the city, you can enjoy Plaza Nueva, uh, see the Granada Cathedral, buy lunch in Mercado San, San Agustin, uh, walk down the whitewashed rows of houses, narrow roads uh, of the Rialjo and Albacin neighborhood, shop in an active bazaar, take night hike from our friends at Six Thrills, and I put a link up there uh, if you want to check these guys out and what they do. For a more active walk, go to the top of the Mirador. Uh, and Mirador, if you see that anywhere, that's just a lookout place. Uh, Mirador de San Nicolas. For a view of Alhambra during sunset or walk down Paseo de los Tristes uh, to scale some of Europe's highest mountains, visit Sierra Nevada National Park, just like the Sierra Nevadas in, uh, in California. And while you're visiting this quaint alpine village, uh, you can check out Capilleria, uh, Pampaniera, Pampaniera, and Treveles are the three little villages I suggest checking out. And if you travel to this region of Spain during winter, it's great for skiing and snowboarding. All right, Barcelona. Like most people, I absolutely love the city of Barcelona. Uh, unfortunately, over tourism has driven up the cost of city, a cost of living for locals who pre-COVID 
uh, 19 were fed up with the number of travelers fitting their city for this reason and to avoid the crowds. I always suggest visiting Barcelona in the off season if you can. If you're visiting southern Spain on your trip, it's best to skip the hot month, summer months anyway. It's important to know that people of Barcelona are proudly Catalonian. So they speak their own language, many of whom think Catalonia should be separate from the country of Spain. People from Barcelona do know Spanish, but of course prefer not to speak it. Um, but if you're walking around, uh, probably better to try to speak Spanish than uh, English if you can. Unless you can pick up some Catalonian and then uh, really impress people. Anyway, the Gothic Quarter is the most famous tourist area of Barcelona. Uh, if you'd like to walk, I'd recommend walking down La Rambla from Plaza Catalonia and heading for Barceloneta and the beach. This area of the city along the Mediterranean is much more modern, was constructed in the, for the 1992 Olympics. The beach and the boardwalk in Barcelona are my favorites uh, compared to, you know, all the other amazing places around the world that you could see or all the other amazing beaches. And they're not particularly unique like the rest of Barcelona, but it's not a bad way to spend a day. Um, I mean, definitely check it out, but I would prioritize all the cool, uniquely Barcelonian stuff. Uh, another walking route to take is from Arc de Triomphe. Um, of course, yes, they do have an Arc de Triomphe in Barcelona also, uh, which you know, you might, well, you will hear about in the next section about uh, France, but uh, you will go down to Park de Ciutela, where you'll find beautiful gardens, monuments, and the Gaudí monument. Uh, for more mind-blowing architecture from Antoni Gaudí, walk around La Sagrada Familia, and then uphill along the pedestrian uh, Avenue, or I guess in, in Catalonian, it's it's going to be Avenida Gaudí, uh, before making your way to one of the most famous works, Parquel. Uh, Gracia is my very favorite local neighborhood, and I'd recommend it to anyone who stays in an Airbnb and lives, uh, and you can live among the Barcelonians, which is a really cool experience. For an early morning sunrise outside of the city center, make your way to the top of uh, Montjuic Hill uh, by foot or cable car and explore uh, the castle of Montjuic, the sprawling parks, the gardens from Barcelona, considering visit, visiting uh, Monte Serrat, Girona, or the Pyrenees Mountains uh, between Spain and France. All right, France. Bonjour. God, I just cracked myself up. France is every solar, solo traveler's gastronomical dream. Get ready for amazing food and wine in every corner of this country. Most travelers will fly into Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, but don't sleep on Lyon. Uh, it is an incredibly underrated city to explore, be sure uh, to check out some of the towns in the French countryside. We did some, uh, I put a link up here to another article about that on the Under 30 Experiences blog. Attempt to speak a little French to be polite to the locals. They really appreciate that. Try to be as polite as possible, even though you may find uh, French people a little bit rude, excuse me, but they do want to be, uh, it's a little more formal. You know, you should always approach someone and say, Bonjour, ça va? And, you know, so you don't just walk up to somebody and uh, ask, like, hey, where's the gas station? You know, anyway, um, also put a link in there for the best French foods, foods to try. Paris. I was lucky enough to call Paris home for six months. And it was easy to understand why people around the world envy the Parisian lifestyle. Yes, I tried to eat gluten-free then, but it didn't stop me from trying the baked goods at the local boulangerie. 
Uh, be sure to enjoy a cafe or espresso seated outside overlooking the street. In Paris, people watching is a serious sport. Uh, bring home a freshly baked baguette to be consumed that day. Escargot, steak tartare are two amazing delicacies in France. Those are two of my favorites. A few of my favorite restaurants I put in here. Uh, I will spare you from my subpar French pronunciation. And uh, now that I've made sure you are sufficiently fed, let's make sure you have a roof over your head at night. Uh, keep in mind that hotels and apartments in France are small, don't normally have air conditioning but you probably wouldn't be spending a lot of time inside. Uh, Paris is broken into 20 arrondissements or districts. Uh, I'd suggest staying anywhere in the first through 11th arrondissement, right? If you wanna avoid being in the most touristy areas, I'd skip the first, second, seventh, and eighth, uh, which are where the Louvre, Notre Dame, Eiffel Tower, Arc de Triomphe are all our respectful respectively. But if you want to stay in a more local neighborhood where young Parisians eat and drink, I would stay in the 11th. Uh, here are some uh, Paris tips on that blog as well from our team in France. Uh, to me, getting lost in the back streets of Paris is incredibly fun. Everywhere you look, there's another magnificent building. Um, when you ask a Parisian, what, what, what's that building? They just shrug it off like it's no big deal because Magnificent buildings are just part of ordinary life. You can walk up down the Seine River, past Notre Dame, the Louvre, uh, Tuileries Gardens, Champs de Elysees, uh, that their garden, all the way to the Arc, <laughs> Arc du Triomphe. Uh, be sure to wander the Latin Quarter, sit out in one of the many parks on the weekend, uh, visit the museums, world famous monuments like the Pantheon, like there's just so much to do in Paris. So uh, go on more active adventures. If you'd like, you can visit the top of Mont Mar, the catacombs, um, and you can enjoy walking the gardens in the Palace of Versailles, which I totally recommend as well. All right, Leon. Uh, well, Leon, does not have the world famous landmarks that Paris has. If you're looking for an experience in an authentic French city without crowds, this town is for you. I found amazing outdoor dining, beautiful architecture, and the distinctly European lifestyle alive and well in Lyon, uh, without some of the pretentiousness that Paris can be known for. My favorite adventure was way up on the left bank of the Saone River. And from the center of Lyon, we walked uphill through this ancient amphitheater. Um, there is their own Notre Dame uh, Basilica up there, beautiful church with a hilltop view. The climb was steep, so expect to get some exercise and uh, you can take the cable car down. Of course, you can take it up if you want to skip the climb. My other favorite excursion was lunch at Le Hall. Uh, and that was an incredible French food market. Here you'll find butchers, bakers, fishmongers, chocolatiers, and yes, plenty of wine. Uh, make sure you try the typical Lyonnaise food, including uh, coquevine, which is a rooster in wine sauce. Spend the rest of your time in Lyon shopping, wandering the pedestrian streets, looking for the beautiful murals painted throughout the city. All right, the south of France. Ready to spend lots of money? Well, you sure can in the south of France. <laughs> Places like Saint-Tropez and Monaco, which is a completely separate country, are known for their lavishness, so expect extremely high prices in the summer. Spending time on the Mediterranean is amazing, but you can spend your budget quickly as a solo traveler if you're not careful. Spend a couple days in each city if you can. Ports and beaches are the main attractions. I found the town of Saint-Tropez extremely charming with the tiny cobblestone streets and La Ponche. Uh, and I enjoyed my time on the beach, but I also felt like too many people were just 
flaunting their wealth and have nots, right? It's just the normal people were just looking on starry eyed. Uh, in the evening in Port uh, Saint Tropez, it was clear it was like, you know, a place to see and be seen if you're into that, that school, but um, the yachts would back it, their slips into their slips and their butlers would serve the passengers, you know, dinner and drinks, their, their guests or whomever, and then people would walk kind of along the promenade and lick their ice cream and watch the rich people eat, which I just thought was really weird. Um, but my best advice always is go check it out if you're curious. Uh, nice, another amazing place. Be sure to check out the Old Quarter. Um, there's a famous market there. You can enjoy the excellent pedestrian area for shopping, eating, another great uh, promenade. Let's see, Castle Hill, right? There's a beautiful uh, castle on the top. The beautiful view of the uh, French Riviera. Uh, Marseille is another great place to eat French seafood. The port is amazing. Um, hang out in Burley Park. See the castle. Visit the small island. There's a small island, Chateau d'If, uh, there. So that's really cool. Uh, the coolest parts of the town to explore and find uh, cafes, boutiques, and bookstores are Le Coup, Julien, and La Plaine. Uh, close to Mar Marseille is Aix-en-Provence, which is probably my favorite town in the south of France. Aix, as the locals call it, um, has been a small university town since 1409. It has mainly pedestrian streets, or at least in the center, fountains, musicians playing outdoors. Uh, old, old Town is the area I'm specifically referring to where you find markets going on. Um, yeah, it's just, just amazing. There's modern art there. And if you haven't had enough yachts and supercars and all that good stuff, you can head to Monaco, which as I mentioned before, is a separate country. Uh, has a casino, great people watching, window shopping. You can see the changing of the guard at the Prince's Palace. You can uh, go in the month of May for the Monaco Grand Prix. And then after that, you could head south to uh, the film festival in Cannes. So the French countryside. Rural France is full of incredible little towns and yes, more amazing food. I highly suggest staying in a gîte or a rural vacation home. Uh, gîtes were originally huts along the Grande, oops, that was Spanish, but a Grand Randonnée, which is a network of 37,000 miles of hiking trails across Europe. I stayed in one of the tiny towns it was called Condom, and yes, it was spelled C-O-N-D-O-M, and no, it's not where condoms are from. I had to ask, but uh, that my French friends had never even heard of this town. In fact, they thought it was kind of funny that there was a French town called Condom. Uh, but it was a magical experience because so far off the beaten path. Um, if you're headed into the French countryside, one way to determine where to go is what type of food and wine that you like. Bordeaux or Champagne are obvious choices if you like red wine. Um, or I, I'm sorry, Bordeaux and Champagne are not red wine. What do I know? But I had a friend who liked red wine. Uh, so of course we went to Burgundy. Uh, Route de Grand Cru is world famous vineyard trail. Uh, Cote du Nuit, and that region of Burgundy. We stayed in this little tiny town called Chambertin because of their famous Pinot Noir grapes. Um, I had a friend who was just obsessed with this one type of wine and he just pinpointed on the map and said, no, we, we gotta go here, we gotta stay here, which turned out to be a really, really cool experience. They take wine very seriously there, as you probably already know. Um, so if you go to this re region, you can visit the small cities of uh, Bonn and Dijon. You've probably heard of Dijon because of Dijon mustard. You can follow, follow the owl trail through the uh, UNESCO heritage site. There's 22 unique 
landmarks, uh, starting at the Church of Notre Dame. Yes, they have a, a Notre Dame as well. And uh, down the road, Bone has is famous for their, they have a rival mustard um, that you've probably seen as well, not quite as popular, but Edmund Follat. Uh, and you can visit his mustard mill, the Hospice of Bone, uh, Hotel Dieu. Uh, one of the amazing places to stay there is Chateau Barouille. And uh, if you do, please say hello to the owner, JP, for us, who we used to work with with under 30 experiences. And believe it or not, France isn't all about food and wine. There is a magnificent mountain range called the Alps. You probably have heard of it. Uh, Les Trois Vallées. Oops, mm, probably not how you pronounce valley in French, but um, three valleys. They're all world famous ski areas. If you get to Chamonix, it's amazing, even in the summer. Uh, Aguille du Midi is an incredible gondola ride up to over 12,000 feet. I know I recommend a lot of cable cars in my solo travel guides, but this, this is the gondola if you're going to ride one. Um, you can watch mountaineers, base jumpers, paragliders, other extreme sports enthusiasts literally hug themselves off cliffs. Um, you can step into the void. They have one of these glass reinforced boxes there where you can get a photo op. Uh, Mont Blanc is really special mountain and it's shared by Switzerland, Italy, and France. And if you go trekking in this area, you can hike between three countries, which is pretty cool. Can't say that every day. And um, under Mont Blanc, right, you can go through the tunnel to uh, Quiramayer, hopefully pronounce that uh, properly. And that's in Italy, which is a, a famous, uh, famous town, ski town as well. And um, again, didn't have time to go into this guide. I mean, France is just everything is stunning and, and famous. But um, you can go to the north part of France where you can visit D-Day Beach, Normandy, of course, Mont Saint-Michel. I would love to get there sometime. Italy. Catch a flight to Rome, Venice, and embrace the slow food movement. Keep in mind that Venice has been plagued by over-tourism. So try to travel off-season if possible to avoid the crowds. Be interesting again what happens post-COVID, but I mean, that would probably be the time to go to Venice. I don't know. Um, not really sure, but it's not a good situation in Venice right now. Uh, or at least it wasn't pre-COVID with all of the tourists. So the old world lifestyle in Italy is really something that changes people, reminds us what life is all about. So that's super important. Um, and the evidence is clear, slower pace with an emphasis on family, community, and eating well allows people to live longer. Um, I, I link to an interview that I did on under30experiences.com with the guys from Blue Zones, which uh, where people live to over 100 years of age often. And one of those places is Sardinia, Italy. There's so much to do solo traveler in Italy. Again, I'm not gonna be able to get into it, but I'm gonna try to cover um, the regions. Actually, I did not cover the regions of uh, Cinque Terre and the Amalfi Coast and Naples, which are also amazing places to visit. But let's get into Rome. One of the most popular cities in the world. And imagine yourself eating Italian food, looking at buildings that are thousands of years old. The Roman Colosseum, the Roman Forum, Palatine Hill, all sit in the same area of the city. I recommend seeing the most crowded tourist places First, while you're excited to be in a new city, before you become tired of being around tourists. That's just my, excuse me, my strategy. The Trevi Fountain is another must do in Rome. Go early in the day, unless you wanna be inundated with couples, eating gelato, making out, you know, maybe you wanna be that couple. Um, this is mainly for solo travelers, but you know, do your thing, win in Italy, win in Rome, as they say, look at that. Anyway, Vatican City, on a more uh, sober note, has incredible 
network of museums, including St. Peter's Basilica and the Sistine Chapel. When I visited the Vatican, I heard the Pope give mass on a hot summer day. I'll tell you, I did not last long in the heat, um, also because the sermon was in Latin. For a more authentic feel, uh, visit the Trastevere neighborhood. It's full of young people and has cheaper food, including pizza, pasta, espresso, tiramisu, that you probably came to Italy for. Stretch your legs afterwards, uh, head up Giancolo Hill, where you have a view from of Rome from above, including the Spanish steps. There's a ton more to do, like go to an opera, so many museums, churches, etc. And get off the beaten path and explore the smaller towns like uh, Perugia, Gubbio, and throw in some active adventures like the Frosty Caves and Marmor Waterfall. And here on the blog article, we linked up a guide to Rome from Angelo, our Italian trip leader. Venice, the romantic canals, and beautiful back alleys of Venice are world famous for a reason. It's so charming. Fortunately, over tourism, climate change, really have negatively impacted the city. It's so expensive that locals can't afford to live there anymore. When a cruise ship is in town, crowds are unbearable. Uh, that being said, try to wake up early and do some things if you do choose to go to Ven Venice. And as I said before, try to get there off season, please. Uh, Piazza San Marco is Venice's main square and where you can find many of the top sites in the city. Uh, Basilica San Marco, uh, Doge Palace, uh, Campanile di San Marco, and the National Archaeological Museum are open to the public for tours to, uh, to get a better look at Venetian history. Escape the crowds in Venice uh, via ferry. There's you know all these islands around Venice, but Burano and Lido are two great ones. Burano has colorful houses, art galleries, boutique shops. Lido is a nice day trip to the beach. And if you are attending a masquerade ball uh, at at carnival, it is. And if it's on your if that's on your bucket list, then check out Venice in late winter and then head north to Turin for some skiing. Milan. Milan is a city that you've probably heard for one thing, and that's fashion. But a couple, a couple more things to do in Milan if you want to spend a couple of days. There's a great flea market for vintage shopping. Um, there are some pretty cool uh, cathedrals, Soforso Castle, Leonardo da Vinci's Last Summer Painting is there. Um, oh, and his secret, uh, secret vineyard. Though known primarily for fashion, the mountains near Milan are also great for skiing. Uh, oh, and I did include Cinque Terre. This region is for wineries, hiking, beautiful coastal views. There's five towns that you can check out all in this region. Also camping, kayaking, churches, ruins. You can sit out with an espresso or have a glass of wine in the harbor in uh, Vernassa. Uh, and then of course there's Naples, which is a gateway to Southern Italy. Eating and drinking, obviously. Uh, you have to visit Pompeii, which is a great stop uh, along the way to Sorrento and Capri. You can see the ancient Roman city of Pompeii and uh, how it was preserved after Mount Vesuvius erupted and covered the city completely in ash. Pretty cool. Sorrento, this Mediterranean city, will be your stop before the Amalfi Coast and Capri. So this is where, uh, if you want to experience those winding drives along the coast that southern Italy is known for, this is where you want to go. Capri has beaches, hiking, small villages, uh, the Blue Grotto Cave to explore. There's another uh, island called Ischia that you should check out. Um, you can check out a castle from the fifth century. And then there's Pisa, which you've of course heard for the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the main attraction, but there are also other attractions there too. Duomo is a nice free cathedral 
to visit. Uh, Palazzo Blu uh, is an art museum that's free, and Lucca is a nice city, uh, about a half hour train ride away from Pisa. That's great to walk around. All right, Iceland. I love this country. So, standing atop a glacier, watching the sunset behind the Eyjafjallajökull Yukul volcano, this is the country that changed everything for me and inspired me with the idea to start under 30 experiences. So if I sound partial towards the country of Ireland, Iceland, excuse me, it's because it holds a special place in my heart. Iceland boasts countless waterfalls, glaciers, volcanoes, Viking sagas, and yes, even elves and trolls, I swear. Bring your hiking boots, bring your best cold weather gear, best rain gear, because the elements in Iceland can get intense, and good luck seeing the northern lights. Obviously better on a clear day. Iceland is one of the most expensive countries in the world, and the currency has fluctuated wildly over the past 15 years. That being said, with careful planning, it is possible to see Iceland on a budget. So, Reykjavik, when you arrive in at Keflavik Airport, you'll immediately be surrounded by black lava rock as you drive to the city center of Reykjavik. Flights from North America usually arrive in the early morning hours, so my first stop is always Egil Jacobson Kitchen for strong coffee and a hearty breakfast. You can walk around the lake there uh, where you'll see the University of Iceland, the National Gallery, and the President of Iceland's office. I kind of find it funny that the President of Iceland has an office. Uh, fun fact, I've actually been to his home on the first ever Under 30 Experiences. Uh, trip, but that is a story for another day. And yes, he was there, like invited into his home. Anyway, stroll around the harbor where whale watching tours depart. Uh, you can see Harp Concert Hall, continue down the promenade to the Sun Voyager historic monument or landmark. If you've seen a photo of Reykjavik, you've undoubtedly seen the big famous church that I am not going to try to pronounce. <laughs> um, and it's at the top of the hill. Get the picture from the top of the tower for the dramatic view of Reykjavik if you want the name of this church. <laughs> if you're wondering, you can look this up on the article, but walk up and down the Lagavulgur where you'll find street art, expensive shops, cafes, restaurants, bars, including the Big Lebowski Bar. Kind of go to the Big Lebowski bar. <laughs> anyway, it's a cult classic. Reykjavik's nightlife scene is impressive. If you like to go out at night, the weekends in Iceland will not disappoint. And during the summer, 24 hours of daylight means the party goes on until the wee hours of the morning. My top pick for place to stay in Reykjavik is Kex Hostel. Uh, Scandinavians love good design, and this hostel is an old biscuit factory, and it doesn't disappoint. It's pretty cool. Uh, Iceland has incredible geothermal hot springs. The Blue Lagoon is world famous, but in the last 10 years, it's become pretty crowded. Uh, I'd opt for the uh, Mivatin Nature Baths. It's just cheaper, more off the beaten path alternative, but if you do go to the Blue Lagoon, be sure to make your reservation in advance, and I would do this right before departing your flight. Uh, you can take the fly bus there. So the Blue Lagoon is between Keflavik Airport and Reykjavik. So yeah, book a couple hours, and it's a really nice relaxing way before your flight um, to chill out. Then the Icelandic countryside. The best way to see Iceland is definitely by traveling the country's ring road. Uh, you drive the entire circum circumference of the island, 822 miles. I've never done it myself, but my local friends say that it takes at least 10 days. Keep in mind that after a couple weeks of car rental, lodging, and food, this can add up to be an expensive trip considering Iceland's prices. After the secret life of Walter Mitty, Hitchhiking and camping in Iceland has become incredibly popular. Locals are friendly, uh, no doubt about it, and pre-COVID they had to combat over-tourism for sure. I was picked up as a hitchhiker in a 1941 World War II truck, and the farmer told me that in the summer the amount of hitchhikers is a problem. 
So kind of interesting there. Um, if you don't have time to drive Ring Road, I'd suggest focusing on two areas of Iceland, both within a few hours of Reykjavik, the South Coast and the Snæfellsnes Peninsula. On the South Coast, you'll want to visit the waterfalls like Salamnir Falls, take the ferry from the breathtaking Westman Islands off the coast of Iceland. Again, look for those puffins. Hike Thorsmark, an incredible area only accessible by four wheel drive that sits between three glaciers. And I'm just gonna show off my Icelandic pronunciation. I've, I've butchered some things on this podcast, but Eyjafjallajökull, Midrajökull, and Tindafjallajökull. If you like to trek, check out the Lagavulgur Trail for the short. Woo! I'm just, I'm not going to pronounce that one. Trail, I don't know that word. Say hello to our friends Atti and Björk at Midgard Base Camp. It's a great hostel run by Icelanders capable of getting you set up for any backcountry adventure. These are hardcore adventure people, so check them out at Midgard. All right, while on the south coast, coast. Take a short stair climb to the top of Skogafoss waterfall on the way uh, to, to, to the Solheimajökull glacier. Uh, finally, finally, Thingvöllur National Park is a great place to see Viking history, including the world's first parliament and snorkeling between the tectonic plates. Arrive early at these locations during peak season, as many of the waterfalls on Iceland's famous. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. Whew, we're going to keep it real here and um, no editing on this podcast. I want to do a straight take to keep it as authentic as possible. Uh, where was I before that monster sneeze? Arrive early at these locations during peak season, as many of these waterfalls are on Iceland's famous Golden Circle and popular among tour groups. And I'm talking like big buses, so be careful. Snifleness is a great way to explore nature on your way to the West Fjords region. Uh, Snifleukulf Glacier is another popular place for an ice walk, but don't worry, you won't need a guide and crampons for all the hikes in the national park. Get your iconic view of Kirkjufell Mountain and its surrounding waterfalls. And it is also the most photographed mountain in Iceland. Fun fact. I don't know how you verify that. Any area outside of Reykjavik should be low in light pollution and good for viewing the northern lights during winter. All right, Greece. The birthplace of civilization is a fantastic place for any solo traveler to explore. Greece offers timeless historic landmarks in Athens and idyllic island hopping through the Mediterranean. Greece is big for European beachgoers, so keep in mind in July and August can be more crowded and expensive. You're seeing a theme here about, uh, about Europe. Look to travel during shoulder seasons like June and September if you can pull it off. While Athens and the Greek islands get most of the attractions, don't forget the rest of Greece has some amazing uh, attractions as well. Um, hiking Mount Olympias and going to Sparta are still on my bucket list personally. So Athens, if you like visiting iconic historic sites, then Athens is for you handful of highlights, including the Greek Agora, uh, Temple of Zeus, Adrian's Palace, Temple of Poseidon, and uh, the stadium there is, and not the Olympic Stadium. I tell that story in my book. I got sent to the wrong Olympic Stadium. I wanted to see the old one, obviously, and they brought me to the new Olympic Stadium to take a picture. I was like, seriously? <laughs> got a little lost in, in Athens. Uh, Anyway, if you like museums, the Acropolis Museum, a um, couple other museums there that I list, including the National Archaeological Museum, are great picks. Placa is a beautiful hillside neighborhood, cobblestone streets, charming Greek taverns. Uh, I could live off feta cheese, olive oil, hummus. Sign me up. That's, um, that's paleo enough, right? 
Uh, all right, there is uh, Lake Abetus Hill that you can hike up. You can ride the gondola back down for another sweeping view of Athens. If you're feeling more adventurous, head outside of the city uh, through Parnitha National Park. Mm, to hike through Parnitha National Park. The Greek islands. All right, when you arrive in Athens, you'll most likely arrive on plane, right? So to help your trip flow better, I would recommend taking a ferry to the Greek islands from Athens rather than going back to the airport. So many islands to choose from, but you really can't go wrong. Paros is one of my favorite places. Uh, Nausa being an awesome little town, whitewashed buildings, winding pedestrian streets. One of my favorite highlights on this island was horseback riding to the beach for sunset. You can do it at sunrise. It's another amazing, unforgettable uh, Greek experience. Naxos is another fun island to explore, including a visit to the Temple of Apollo. You can hike through the mountain villages, finish it off with some of their local liquor. Uh, the reason that Santorini is so famous is because everyone who visits says it's absolutely stunning. It's really hard to beat the sunsets um, there. Keep in mind that uh, Cyclades is the most popular Greek island to visit, so expect to pay more than the other islands. While the beaches aren't as white and sandy as the other islands, uh, Cyclades makes it up with the Santorini volcano. You can go hike to the caldera of this incredible, mostly submerged volcano, and you can visit vineyard there to taste the grapes of Greece. All right, moving along, we're getting the home stretch here. Croatia. Croatia is many people's favorite country to visit for similar reasons to why they love Greece. This country boasts beautiful beaches, islands, historic architecture, Island hopping through the Adriatic Sea is something that is on many people's bucket lists, and it should be. Croatia is a cheaper country than most Western European countries. But because of its popularity with tourists during peak summer months, it's gotten more expensive in recent years. Uh, as I always recommend, try to travel in shoulder season, blah, blah, blah. You guys get it. Uh, this guy doesn't cover the cheaper, that was rude of me giving you blah, blah, blah. But, you know, I shouldn't assume that everybody knows. But at this point, Europe is mainly the same. July and August, crowded. June and September, excellent. Or at least much better. This guy doesn't co cover some of the more off the beaten path areas like Zagreb, the capital, and uh, the national park up there. But just know that there's plenty to do in the interior of Croatia. But we focus this um, on the main areas, which we're gonna talk about Split. So Old Town Split is UNESCO Heritage Preserve. So I suggest take a walking tour uh, through Marmont Street, the square, the traditional markets, understand the influences of the different cultures from the Romans uh, to the Slavic, right? You can visit the palace from where Game of Thrones uh, was filmed. See Split from above by going up Margin Hill for a sprawling view of the Adriatic Sea, cool off with a swim at the beach, go kayaking for sunset. From Split, I'd recommend that any solo traveler take the ferry to Havar uh, in the Paklini Islands. Paklini Islands, excuse me. All right, the islands. There's over a thousand of them. I don't know if you heard me counting, but most travelers have probably only heard of a handful. So here are my few picks that I would recommend. As I said, Havar. Uh, there's a beautiful bay where you'll find less crowded beach to relax on uh, that I point out in the article. Take a short hike up to the Venetian fortress located in Havar's old town, Havar's a party town. So please have a good time, but understand that locals need to live here too. So, you know, behave yourself. Be sure to take a speedboat ride to the island of Vis to experience the Blue Cave. Continue your journey to Korkula. 
after your walk around Old Town, head to the small village of Poupant, away from the tourists for a traditional family restaurant, homemade wine, visit uh, the winery in Lombarda there, another small village, see the influence of Greek settlers, uh, walk on uh, Prison Bay, and you, it's one of the rare sandy beaches on the Adriatic, so check that out. Take the ferry to the mainland to visit more wineries, see one of the longest walls in the world, the village of Stona, and test, taste fresh oysters straight from the farm. Dubrovnik, often referred to as the Pearl of the Adriatic. I'd recommend finishing your trip in Dubrovnik. You could do this itinerary in the verse, in reverse, flying into Dubrovnik and departing from Split, but I would recommend flowing this way. Walk around historic old town. Uh, more than 600 years of history can be seen before your eyes. Visit uh, St. Blaise Church and Sponza Palace. Hike to the top of Mount Surd for another stunning sunset. Take a day trip to uh, Locrum an island with no cars, hang out on the beach, visit the Benedictine mon Monastery. And if you want to go see more of the Balkans, I'd suggest that you go out to Montenegro, including the towns of Kotor, Perast, and Budva. It's very close. All right, getting to the end here, Central Europe. Whew. Well, I couldn't cover the entire continent. I want to highlight a few cities um, in Central Europe. If you get to go to Central Europe, it's really easy on the train. You can hop between these cities, which is awesome. If you get the chance to go see the night markets around Christmas, it's really an unforgettable experience. So, Prague. Fly into the Czech Republic capital and experience the beautiful parks and medieval architecture. Go to the top of the Petrin Lookout Tower, the Prague Castle, and experience one of the many microbreweries. Wander through Old Town Square and feel like you've gone back in time to the 10th century. Cross the Charles Bridge and its many replica statues. You can see the real statues at the National Museum. Get your picture taken in front of the John Lennon Wall where the words let it be, have been a symbol of peace for nearly 40 years. Vienna, travel to Vienna, Austria, rich in culture, food, and art. There are tons of amazing gardens and plazas, including Belvedere Palace, the Imperial Palace, and the Hofburg Palace. Admire the Gothic architecture of St. Stephen's Cathedral and get your fix of museums in uh, this general area. You can experience fine art in this city like uh, opera music, classical music, visit the Mozart Museum. Wow, you guys are just getting cultured here. Strolling Ring Road is another enriching experience for some hiking. You can uh, head outside of the city to the Vienna Woods. And for a great day trip, Head to Bratislava for more castles, cathedrals, and medieval delights. Budapest. Head to Hungary. And you can explore another one of Central Europe's best cities for solo travelers. Explore Old Town. Walk around uh, the Danube River. Visit Parliament. Castle Hill is a great neighborhood protected by UNESCO. Cobblestone alleys, great views. Castle Hill, you can climb and see a great sunset, go to Central Market, eat some Hungarian food, when all that walking gets to you, soak in the baths in City Park, check out the ruined bars uh, in the old Jewish quarter for some of the best nightlife in Europe, visit the home of one of the famous, most famous Hungarians, are you ready? Harry Houdini. I know you knew that. Escape the city for a river cruise and see the small town of Etiek for some great cuisine. I check out Margaret Island and Obuda Island as well. And what about Scandinavia, Amsterdam, Germany, Portugal, and all the other amazing places for solo travelers in Europe that I missed? 
Well, that was 7,500 words. And um, hopefully, you know, check back for updates uh, on the Under 30 Experiences blog. Thank you guys for sticking with me. If you liked this, you will like my book, The Millennial Travel Guidebook, Escape More, Spend Less, and Make Travel a Priority in Your Life. And if you like uh, hearing things, the audio version was way better produced than this. You can get that on audible.com, The Millennial Travel Guidebook, and uh, I really took my time through it. It took me days upon days to record an audio book. But um, yes, I stopped every time I messed up the pronunciation of something and uh, did my very best. So anyway, if you guys have any feedback, uh, reach out to me. The best way is probably on Instagram for my travel content. Instagram, uh, that is Matt Wilson TV. And uh, thanks for checking out the Millennial Travel Podcast. If you're watching on YouTube right now, yes, that's also available on uh, iTunes, Spotify, all those good places. Thanks again, and talk to you soon.